If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. These cups come courtesy of Nicole from Belgium. Mm-hmm. She stole them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But they look just like um, little daiquiri glasses almost. I feel like I need to be on a tropical island with this glass. I love it. It is really good. What is it? I like fruity drinks. Mm. Um, that sounded really flamboyant. It just sounded flamboyant. It's a, I feel like, I don't know. Um, but anyway, it is called jazz fest jen found this cocktail mm-hmm. and um we had most of the ingredients already which is always good so it's um 151 rum malibu rum um spiced rum it called for silver rum which we did not have so i just did double the spiced rum glad you didn't um, do double the 151 yeah <laughs> we, we could have taken that lighter and just <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Um, and some grenadine, and then there's, um, it was an orange pineapple mixed juice mm-hmm. and a passion, passion fruit, fruit juice mm-hmm. all together, and it is delicious. It is really good. Thank mm-hmm. you. So it is a Taco Tuesday, and I hope you guys enjoyed the episode we just put out yeah, today. Yeah, Tara Grinstead, where there was already an update. Yes. I know. Bo Dukes, 25 years. Bo Dukes, 25 years. I good feel luck. like I... I was only there for half of the episode, but my counterpart was there for the rest of it. <laughs> you did tell Sober Jen, or Drunk yeah. Jen told Sober Jen that she would relay several messages. Yes, I did. I did hear yeah. those today. So, <laughs> Did you remember any of that? Um, the video is yeah, freaking hilarious. Oh, no. <laughs> That's concerning. So, so <laughs> welcome to Talk Murder to Me. Oh, yeah. Do did we already sure. do that? I don't know. Um, oh. Do it again. Welcome to Talk Murder to Me. It's Taco Tuesday, and we're here recording for You's Day. Oh. <laughs> oh, cute. Yeah. Oh, we need to come up with something for Thursdays yeah, Thursday. if we release the hometown stuff on Thursday. Thirsty Thursday. Mm. So the hint tonight was jazz. Mm-hmm. Jazz. Jazz man. Oh, jazz man. That's Carol King. Um, also, on The Simpsons, they, Lisa doesn't... Yes. Meets the jazz man. Um, name the guy. Uh, e Street Band guy. No, the, the guy, her, her mentor, name him. The jazz man. No. I can't. Ah, oh, come on, Jen. It's gone. I, mm, just... I, I know the first part of his name. I can't think of it. I know it's Bleeding Gums. I think Bleeding Gums Murphy, isn't it? I have no idea. But No idea. Do you play the jazz flute? <laughs> oh, yeah. I yes. was not prepared yes. for this. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I'm gonna do. He'll play some jazz flute. <laughs> surprise shots, surprise shots. We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. Oh, that wasn't bad. Is it like some type of chai tea or something? It wasn't as bad as I thought it was gonna be. It was the Spice Jaeger. Hmm. Which we have now that. finally finished. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Jen, the hint tonight was jazz. Mm. So where are we going? Who are we killing? I'm conflicted because I know that you said we were doing a hometown murder. So mm. I was trying to think of where our Supremos lived. But I want to say I'm tied between two. Um, hmm. Well, you only get one just I know. guess, Jen. We we go over this every week. I know. So but pick it's so one. Hard. <laughs> pick one of those. But neither of those places are like where our t- Supremos live currently. Well, so pick I don't know. one, Jen. Um, <laughs> and only say one. Don't sneak the other one in. I know you're going to. <laughs> one is really obvious, so I feel like I need to go with the other one and say Chicago. Chicago. In the 1920s. And I think we're talking about um, something like um, Prohibition time during the 20s. Maybe Al Capone or something. I don't know. Is the story you're guessing Al Capone? No. Because that's too, like, blatantly out there. I'm not guessing a particular story. I'm just saying related to the mob. Well, you have to guess the story, Jess. Related to the mob. Jazz. Uh, 
Okay, it's it's a mob story. Okay. It's a mob story. So I was also torn. Um, no, one guess. One. I, I, I'm just. I'm only. Gonna Wait, pick if one she place. guesses my, if she guesses my other one, can I say? No. Yeah. No, you, you can can't. It. No, you can that's not it. fair. You can cut it out. But I know. Yeah, but, but I it's know not... exactly where I know. I swear, I only had two. New places. Orleans. Yes. That's my guess. That's my official guess. I will say I was think I was wondering if jazz was a hint for jazz in Australia. Oh. And you were trying to be devious about that. So I'm just gonna say it's He's New Orleans. Smirking. He is smirking. About jazz being about Australia. Damn, I really hope it's not Australia. <laughs> um but I think that this story is um a voodoo story. Oh, that's a good voodoo. One. Voodoo. No, yeah, voodoo is yeah. Kate, yeah. Voodoo queen. Um, oh. um it's a Mardi Gras murder. Oh, that sounds like fun. You know it's a fun story. <laughs> I hope <Huh>. not. <laughs> it does not sound fun. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Let's go to Mardi Gras. I and want get to murdered. go to Mardi Gras. I want to go so you know, bad. I thought I wanted to do that as one of the things on my bucket list, and after seeing like videos of people there, I don't want to go to Mardi Gras. So that means I probably would want to go to Mardi Gras. <laughs> you guys can stay like outside the city, drop me off, and then pick me up when I'm like. Just- I mean, like I'll go to brunch the next day before the hungover people wake up and get some beignets. So you go to brunch without me? I mean, if you're going to be too hungover to miss it, then yes, yes, I am. <laughs> wow, I'm going to go have some beignets, Jen. Yes. Okay, so it is. Taco Tuesday. I hope you guys enjoyed the story we just put out. And if you're listening to this, it's probably Thursday. Thank you for being a subscriber to Talk Murder to Me. These are our hometown murders. And tonight we are reading from a book for from one of our members, Taco Supremo. And the book is entitled The Axeman. Oh, yes! Ah, uh, uh, yes! The Axeman of mm, New Orleans, mm. a true story. This is for Tyler. Hey, guys. I'm just putting in a request for a good story called The Axeman of New Orleans. Kind of reminds me of like an early version of the Zodiac Killer in a way that he sent letters to newspapers saying, do this or die. I thought it was a good story. Love the show. Thanks. Tyler, this is a really you know gruesome story. So you know what's funny? <laughs> do you know the Axeman story? Yes, I do. Oh, I do not. You know what's funny is that when you when we were talking about Jazzman, I was gonna say. Remember, I almost said Axeman, but then I remembered yeah. it was Jazzman. Oh. Well, this is a very awesome story. Thank you so much, Tyler. I I had a lot of fun researching this, and I hope you enjoy this one. This one's for you. And actually, if you're a fan of Ryan Murphy, like I am, and if you like American Horror Story, the Axeman makes an appearance in season three. That is correct. Coven. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Interesting. So mm-hmm. this is a like famous. Yes. Tell me what you know, Jen. Killer. He played jazz music. Wait, he? Why's it got to be a he? No well, one ever no, figured yeah, out. Yeah, I he guess. Is. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh, this is like a this is like a Jack the Ripper type mm-hmm. case unsolved. Well, this was after Jack the Ripper, but this yeah, it had 1920s, right? it had the same effect as Jack the Ripper. Oh. Mm-hmm. Never heard of it. It's not as popular, but I think it's more crazy. It's definitely crazier than Jack the Ripper, in my opinion. Yeah, I am excited for the story. And I what I know about the accident is based solely off of my viewing of American Horror Story, so I'm not going to pollute the airwaves. What did you say? What did, what did you... Because I don't remember. I just know that he played jazz music, he was, was, or he, she, he or she was a trumpet player. Was it like just like kind of a play, side, like a background story? Background, or but it, also like it had to do with his murders. He would play jazz music after. Huh. They would leave jazz music playing, right? Is that right? I don't know. I don't remember. I'm making stuff up. This is a false memory. Memory. Flashbulb memory. <sighs> Cannot be trusted. Because we've been talking about like weird dreams lately. Oh my I, God. Do you remember my weird dream from the other night? There was a lot going on. There yes. was like Voldemort involved. There's yes. a lot of things. There was a lot. Um, so I've been also having I normally don't really dream. I know. It, but lately I've been taking Benadryl because allergies are terrible right now. Right. So I've been taking Benadryl at night and I have been tripping. I 
so I, I mean they've been like really fucking random write dreams. them down so we can share them uh, we can all have yeah. a segment about our dreams but i do i don't really remember the dream but i do remember being absolutely convinced in the dream that yesterday was tuesday and today was wednesday and i i was like i remember just waking up being like oh yes it's hump day like fuck yeah and then i was like are you sure Wait. that that's not just like you convincing yourself in your mind about today in real life but I think I was dreaming it because oh. I think I think it was like part of the dream because I, I when I'm stressed, I dream about work like I dream about work related things a lot. Mm, yeah, me too. Which sucks. Yeah, it does suck. You know what also sucks? Dreaming that your teeth fall out and actually feeling them fall out. And it's really terrifying. Oh, or when you fe- have a dream that your teeth are loose and like you, can, you like ever so slightly feel like you can move them when yep. you wake up. Oh, my gosh. Yep. I hate that or feeling. like but in my dreams, I get that, too. But in my dreams, they actually like crumble i could i like chew on them not like intentionally Uh, but like they come out and i'm like they like crumble yeah they crumble it's really terrifying and disgusting and i hate it in my dream i thought it was wednesday and so now i'm like not that i'm disappointed that it's taco tuesday but i already thought taco tuesday happened and it was a great taco tuesday and i was like Mm. god fucking damn it we're a day behind and when you're so early in the week like that it's one thing when it's thursday and you think it's friday when it's only Tuesday and you think it's Wednesday. Yeah, it's a totally oh, different phenomenon. Oh, there's right. so much left in the week. You guys ready? Yeah. Jen said the 1920s. She's very close. 1919. Mm. Now, this is four days after Mardi Gras. Oh, damn. I got two parts kind of right. No, four days after Mardi Gras. I said a so Mardi Gras murder. March 9th, 1919 is where we're going so tonight. So we were both wrong about what you were right about new orleans i mean like and i was like half right because i didn't say it out loud but in my head i knew that that's where we were going (laughs) but i guessed chicago so i was wrong and also um i said it was 1920s but it was not and you said it was mardi gras and it was not so we're wrong on that sorry try again we're talking about italian immigrants tonight and i'm gonna tell you um Go through the oh, history of that. Oh, that's a terrifying photo. Yeah, they're all pretty terrifying. So, why are old photos so scary? Yeah, the they photo are. I'm showing you now is of possessed. Uh, two in cross-eyed. Uh, the Italian immigrants, Charles. Like, I feel like I'm going to go to bed, and that image is going to pop Shit. up in my mirror. Ah, uh, this is going to be my better dull dream tonight. <laughs> okay, we're no. the. Do you ever get scared of looking in the mirror Jen, after watching a scary oh movie? Oh my god! Let me at least start the first paragraph. Please. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. Okay, at least I'm not alone. We're talking about Charles and Rosie Cortamiglia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. It's Italian. They, they're they Italian immigrants. They have a two-year-old daughter. Her name is Mary. As you see up here, that's Mary. Okay, this is March 9th, 1919, 3 a.m. Everyone's passed out, sleeping, snoring, dreaming good. <sighs> Okay, this is in the Gretna neighborhood, which is uh, right by New Orleans. It's the next one over. A neighbor, Hazel Johnson, is a black lady named Hazel Johnson. She bolts out of her residence, which is pushed up right next to theirs. This is their house right here that mm-hmm. I'm showing you. So her house, her you home. You can see the roof of the house next door. Her home is right next door. She runs out. This is three in the morning. Everyone's sleeping, and Gretna is kind of a smaller town compared to New Orleans. Everyone just passed out sleep, dead silence. She runs out of the house. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. She Her screaming was so loud that she woke up 17-year-old Frank Giordano and his 20-year-old sister from their sleep. Now, they live, they're neighbors as well. Frank Giordano stumbles downstairs. He has no shoes on. He's barely dressed. He's hearing this, oh my God, oh Jesus. It's like three in the morning. He's probably like, shut the fuck up. What the hell? Sounds like you, John. I don't do that at three in the morning. If something happened at three in the morning, that's probably what you do. Yeah, but you don't wear shoes. Yeah. He (laughs) screams to his sister, Lena, what's the trouble? Is it mama? Oh, that was kind of Italian. Is it mama? Is mama okay? Lena started crying out. They're dead. Everyone is dead. Whoa. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, when the police get there, this is what they see, because the police get there pretty quick. I mean, this is a a ruckus going wild in this town. Everyone's Mm -hmm. woken up now. The husband, Charlie, the Italian immigrant, 
laying draped across the bed, completely bloody. The entire bed sheets, everything is completely blood soaked to the core. Two severe cuts had sliced through the top of his head into his skull. So deep, the cuts were so deep that it fractured his skull and it cut into the soft tissue of the brain. Okay? Now, this is what the police saw. scrambled eggs. This is what the police saw. The result... It is. So, when you get cut, or when someone swings an axe at your fucking head and hits you right in the skull... What happens is you get instant swelling from the brain. And if your skull is completely fractured, which his was, the brain matter oozes out. It's like a concussion, except concussions are contained. So his brain matter is actually oozing out of his skull because of the swelling. Now, his wife that was sitting next to him, Rosie, she was next. She was next to get hit. She suffered severe, deep gashes in the head and one in her left ear. The depressed fracture in her skull was so severe that pressure built up in her skull, and unlike her husband with brain matter oozing out, hers had nowhere to go. It exploded? No, it... Yes, it exploded. (laughs) Like, what was that movie we were watching? The one with the... um, Where the heads exploded? The zombie one? The... The, the one where the they injected the dead people with that stuff and the heads. Oh yeah, I don't know some B rated movie. More all right. Was it that built one that Bill Murray was in? No, it was some weird B rated. The tragic thing about this is Mary, the daughter, two year old daughter, was also a victim. She died instantly from one severe blow to the top of her skull. Who the shit would come in there and kill a two-year-old girl, baby girl? The local media actually reported the funeral, because they immediately had a funeral for her, as, quote, one of the saddest funerals ever held in Jefferson Parish. Mary, the daughter, two-year-old daughter, was placed in a small box and buried because the family, the Italian immigrants, didn't have money to afford an actual casket. It was like probably really sad, the funeral. Plus, I'm like sure. you can't see. They probably didn't even have an open no. viewing because. Oh no! I mean, and and a child, her her skull and her head isn't done growing. It's still soft. So obviously, an axe. You know, ugh. it's like. Taking an axe to a peach. Yeah, here you go. Mm. Nicole, can you read um, this? Can you see this? Yes, I can. Charles Cortiniglia and his young wife, Rosie, lay draped across their bed from opposite sides. The body of their dead toddler lay still between them. The room was soaked in crimson. Blood drenched the bed. It speckled the wall, stained the curtains. It pulled the floor. You could have wrung buckets of it out with the mosquito bar, the gauze-like netting that had covered the sleepers. From one wall, a picture of the Virgin Mary serenely down on the pain and blood. I do want to point out this story. Uh, all the the people that live in the, the neighborhoods that we're going to be talking about, had mos- if you hear the word mosquito nets, I guess they slept in mosquito nets because it was so bad at the time. They probably had no air conditioner. Swamp south, Swampy. yeah. So I mean, you have to sleep in a mosquito net. There's no AC. I cannot imagine living yeah. in the south. Fuck, even in Massachusetts, it gets really hot in the summer for a couple weeks. Like you want the air conditioning on, but I cannot imagine living in the south without air conditioning because it is on. 24 7 from may 1st to october 1st solid 24 7 yeah dr jerome laundry laundry I was like, <laughs> that's, really? his that's his name l-a-n-d-r-y landry let's call him laundry the doctor landry immediately performs a cranianotomy on Rosie. Now that is to relieve the pressure in her, her skull. So basically, he wait is Rosie alive? No. Yes, she's oh, alive. What? She what? is still alive. She is. She's hanging in there, still breathing. <laughs> I mean, she's unconscious. In a coma. 
probably in a coma. He immediately, the first thing he does, I mean, I, I want to say right off the bat, all these people that get treated by these doctors in this story, there is no anesthesia. There is no cleanliness of, oh, sterile needles and stuff. It is straight. like You're going to die some so way, shape, or when form. When you hear the word craniotomy, that's basically he takes a scalpel and cuts her skull well, open to already, relieve the pressure. She's already unconscious from the yeah. pain. But still. Um, Good Lord. Well, there are some, well, they do numb you for the pain, but where you are awake when they're like going in your brain. Yeah. But it like that you don't feel the pain, but you have to be like alert and talking to them to make sure that they don't. That's so weird. Hit the wrong. Oh no! I know. No no no, no 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 no! I don't want to hear that. Okay, so now a theme that we're going to be talking about a lot is Frank Giordano, the one that actually ran out and flagged down the cops to come, the one that heard the screaming to begin with. He was actually charged with the murder. Because the police believe the murder was over a rent dispute. He was renting the home that he lived in from Rosie and her husband, Charles. Now, I do want to say that theme comes up a lot. And there's a lot of people they put in prison. And while they're awaiting trial in prison, the axe man, the real axe man, continues to murder people. Yep. And the, the reason I'm saying that is because police were under so much pressure because of the mass hysteria of this case, they had to do something. So they had just arrested anyone, and then they were like, shit, let's, let's like, you know, get them to death penalty real quick before the axe man kills again. You know what I'm saying? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Next. <laughs> yeah. That was good. The police, the That's police good. in this story, <laughs> you'll see the police in this story never wants to admit the, quote, phantom Axe man that roamed the streets of New Orleans the for twenty years. Yeah. On the upper is there inside your mind. The axe man was never identified. No one knows who this guy is. And as I continue to dive in the story, everyone was thinking he was some sort of spirit. The way that he would just come in the night and and kill and then leave without being seen, and I I kind of believe it. I not believe it, but believe why they believed it. I believe why they believed it, and why the mass hysteria that there was so much fear in this case, and he only kills Italian immigrants. Okay, so if you're not Italian, you have nothing to worry about. But if you're Italian then you were up every night. People were actually hospitalized for intense insomnia because they could not go to sleep because they were so scared. So the killer was racist? He was probably a Mick. That sounds very I, rare. Is Mick Irish? <laughs> yeah, I can say it because I'm a, I'm a Mick. All right. I'm an so, Irish. Right, so I mean, so the, the killer is racist if, he's only, if he, it's targeted. I know we don't think today of Italians as being ones that would be targeted, but back in the 1920s, they were not yeah. um, accepted members of society. Yeah, we'll get to that. All right. The Axe Man was never identified. The media called him the Axe Man of New Orleans. Axe Man Jack, the Cleaver, which I think is a really cool name, and... The Hatchet Man. <laughs> so he got he got sounds like a superhero. The yeah. Hatchet Man. He got four different monikers. Man, man, man. <laughs> All right, let's quickly define his mo, and then we'll get to some more gruesome stuff. Oh, good. Enjoy. Just a couple things you guys got to keep in mind. His mo. He always used an axe or a weapon owned by the residents themselves. He never brought a weapon to the crime scene, except for one time, which I'm going to talk about. Everybody has axes in their house? Yeah, everyone has that. I mean, because think about it. You got to chop wood. You got the pig slaughter out there. Everyone had pigs. I you got to fight off the axe man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he... Oh, all right. <laughs> which is a weapon that then be, is used against you. A small door panel, as you see there, would always be removed, which the killer, the axe man would remove with a rail pin. 
Or, or like a, it's like a chisel. He would remove a part of the door. So that no, could, right oh. there, you see the big hole. He would remove. See, these aren't like we got with these nice vinyl and all this stuff. Like, these are shanties. Yeah, so, so made of wood. Like he would remove the panel so he could go in and yeah. Unlock the no, door. he wouldn't unlock it. See, that's what I thought. He wouldn't unlock the door. He would climb in that hole. Oh, yeah, and then climb back out. See, I thought that's he a, would. That's a small hole. Exactly. Though. He must be a skinny man. Or woman. not from what witnesses say, and we'll get to that. But yeah, exactly. Hmm. He would use a rail spike pen, which is this, uh-huh. to chisel away at that. And he'd stay there for probably an hour just chiseling real quiet. And sometimes neighborhood dogs would bark. What? <laughs> I mean, that's a long time. Like, exactly. That's not a, that's not a quick entry. Exactly. Which he would, would sit there. Which you would think he would need. Yeah. No. And he was if so... If he's a phantom, th- especially. This is why they say he's a phantom. Because in the pitch quietness of these towns, he's out there chiseling for God knows how long. And the, the victims don't even see him. Like the wife won't even know he's there until the husband has already been hit multiple times. Also, like, like there's not street lamps or anything it's dark out there yeah you don't have like a yeah. headlamp or yeah, a cell yeah. phone light good you know? point good point now the killer this is a it reminds me a lot of the golden state killer because he would never take anything from the house of value but he would always say give me your money and he and he would take some money when he first started killing but as it continued he would leave money on the dresser you're not his own money, but he would see like silver coins there and he wouldn't even take them. You know, he he wouldn't take the money. So it's like he didn't need the money, um, which is like the Golden State Killer did the same thing. The surviving victims would say he that he always demanded money at, at first, you know, and then his M.O. changed. Now, the weapon would always be abandoned at the scene of the crime. And it's weird because he would like throw it under the steps or into the tall grass where he knows the police are going to find it, but he's like kind of hiding it. It's almost like a game. Mm. Does that make sense? But back then they didn't have to worry about DNA either. So yeah. it's like if it, it was more, more concerned to the criminals back then to be found with this weapon on their person than to leave it behind at the scene for it to be dusted for fingerprints and yeah. evidence. Most importantly, all the victims that I'm talking about tonight were Italian immigrants. Mm. 80% of the Italians that came over to New Orleans were Sicilian. And I'll talk about that Good in pizza. a second. What's the difference between Sicilian pizza? Like, is it this? They're like it's Sicilian like pizza and crust, what? Right? Sicilian pizza and what? You said, what's Reg- the difference between regular si- pizza? No, Neapolitan pizza? Yeah. I think Sicilian pizza is typically thicker in crust and sometimes it's square. Yeah. Okay. I, was, I thought I was thinking it was square. Um, there's a place downtown um, near the Citadel. It's called Unita Sicilian Sicilian and mm-hmm. Pizza. And there's also a place right down the same street called um, Shoot. I forget, but I think it's Detroit style pizza, which I've never had. I wish there was a Chicago pizza here in Toronto. Yeah. Holy shit! That Chicago pizza was delicious. Oh my! Goodness. It's so cheesy. I've never had Chicago style pizza it's like uh, in so Chicago. Cheesy. It was really except for good. Pizzeria Uno. That's the only kind of deep dish Chicago pizza I've had, and that's not like real. I feel like I feel like I mean I know it's real, but but not as good as I mean we go get you know go up there. We can make an excuse. One of the weird things about this case is not every one of the victims died. In fact, a lot of them didn't die. That's surprising. This I'm showing you a picture right now. Oh, this wow. kid, his name is John Andalina. He's a kid, and he's showing off his axe wound right in the head. Oh, my word. Not every one of his victims died, which makes it really weird. That is weird. Yeah. yeah. It's like he was just going there and there for the thrill of it just to hit people with an axe. He didn't yes. check to make sure that they exactly. were dead. And, and half of the people literally didn't die. Okay. I'm so surprised. I mean, he wasn't very good with his technique then. <laughs> Unless he was not intending yeah. to kill all of them, in which Maybe. case. All right. Let me go over a short, brief history of the Italian. Maybe he wants to get caught. 
No, he def the Italian. Let me go over a short, brief history of the Italian migration to New Orleans because I think it's very important. All right, I'm going to run through this real quick history lesson. New Orleans was founded on May 7th, 1718, from a guy named Philippe II or the Duke of Orleans. New Orleans was and is still a melting pot of culture. I've never been. Have you guys been? No, no but I would like to go. Me yeah. too. Even to this day, is a melting pot of culture. In fact. Since the founding of the city and up till today, it has went through six different national affiliations. 1718 to 1763, it belonged to the kingdom of France. 1763 to 1802, it belonged to the kingdom of Spain, which are the great majority of buildings in the famous French Quarter are dated from this period. Interesting. 1802 to 1803, it belonged to the French First Republic. A.K.A. the Napoleonic Forces and Napoleon and his gang. 1803 to 1861, it was purchased by the United States of America under the Louisiana Purchase. Oh, that's Nicole Laporte, our third place Geography B winner. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole Laporte. That was actually history, but that's okay. Oh. 1861, it succeeded from the Union, becoming one of the largest cities in America. Succeeded. Seceded. 1862, it was captured by the Union troops. So a year later, captured and as part of the USA. God, I love the USA. Okay. Louisiana. Nicole, where's Louisiana? It's the boot. It's the boot. Very good. Das Between, boot. Das boot. Between Florida in Texas. There you go. Thank you. And there's a couple of random states in between. Yeah, oh. Mississippi. Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Mith- the- Florida, Louis- Mississippi. Louisiana, the boot is the watershed for the Mississippi River. In fact, and I didn't know this, it was at the time a destination up until 1920 when they banned immigration of two thirds of the slaves hmm. that came over, which I thought it was in Charleston, but no, uh, Louisiana. Hmm. They also had 13,000 gens de couleur libres, which means free people of color, also known as mulattoes. Mm. Now, the Italians That's were, correct. the Italians started as slaves, just like the African Americans coming uh, from West Africa. They worked right alongside of them. This was during the sugar plantation boom. The Italians were very hard workers and they were very frugal with their money. In fact, the the whole uh, outline of an Italian immigrant goes like this. Started as a slave, a paid slave, saves their money, becomes peddlers like of food and stuff like that, vegetables or whatever. Pizza. And after that, they saved enough money to open up their own grocery store, which is all the victims in here are Italian grocery owners. Really? So they were all started as slaves, saved up their money. And open their own groceries. Kind of like the vendors have their grockery. Yeah, their grockery. <laughs> uh, 290,000 Italian immigrants came to Louisiana. 80% were from Sicily. They all arrived as slaves. Mm. And they were treated just as badly as the African-American slaves. And they were referred to, and this will come up later, as... Guineas. No, not guineas. Oh. What is, that's like an Australian. I actually no. thought that that was an um, an Irish term. Yeah. No, Irish are the mix. The Italians are guineas. Oh, like these. Uh, I thought a guinea was like about well, maybe in Guinness. A, maybe something. in Italy they refer to that, but in America they were referred to as dagos. D a g o e s. Never heard of it. 1820 through 1860 was the quote glory years, and Nicole, you can read. This. Glory days. Dun, 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 dun. In Justin Nystrom's professor of history at Loyola University of New Orleans, book New Orleans After the Civil War, Race, Politics, and a New Birth of Freedom. You went to Loyola. Different Loyola. I know, but, but still. Yeah. Uh, in 1860, New Orleans stood out as the at the apex of its wealth and strength. With nearly 170,000 residents in 1860, it was nearly four times the size of Charleston or Richmond. New Orleans' strategic location on the Mississippi River, combined with the westward expansion and the advent of steam-powered river transportation, had transformed it from its status as a colonial port at the time of the Louisiana Purchase into the unrivaled economic capital of the antebellum city. South. All right. So, Tyler, you're getting us our history. We're learning a lot of history. 
the and the reason we're learning history is not because we want to learn it; it's because it plays a very vital role into why this Axeman is killing a bunch of Italians. Education is good, though. Yeah, but you know what? I've recently I really enjoy watching like as far as movie genres. I really like biographical films. Hmm. You know, like I and think true stories are are more appealing to me than like fiction. I like actually. I I kind of like the best of both of those things. I like really like historical fiction. Mm. Like Inglorious Bastards? Yes. Yeah. Oh my god, or that is one of my favorite yeah. freaking movies. The Nightingale. Yeah, that I, I don't lo- think I've seen that one. Um, no, it's a book. It's a book. Oh. It's so, so good. And all, like actually most of the books that I read are actually historical fiction. Like that, I didn't really realize it. And fun fact, Tacos, Supremos and Tacos and everyone that's listening. Um uh Tarantino is coming out with a Manson movie. Oh my god, I have, have got to we've got to see that yeah. in theaters. Yep. Sit in bar. I fucking love Tarantino. Inglorious Bastards is one of my all time favorite movies. Who is it? Kill Bill Volumes One and Two. I've never seen the second one. Actually, I don't really? even know. I've never seen all of the Kill Bill first uh, one either. So good. They're, I think they're all on Netflix. Probably. We day. Um, yeah, whenever you have time. <laughs> so when? <laughs> um, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Awesome. It was very good. Um, there was that one movie that we didn't finish, um, but it was like that Western movie. We never finished it. Um, oh, Seven, um, Magnificent yeah. Seven or something like that. Or Hateful Eight. Hateful Eight. Hateful Eight is what it was called, I think. Louisiana, New Orleans was – the reason it was so popping back then is because the Mississippi River literally – feeds into it and then brand- spider webs all throughout the United States. So that was the place for e-commerce, not e-commerce. <laughs> <laughs> yes, cut, just commerce. For commerce. <laughs> if you wanted a website built. Well, I mean, for the Italians, e-commerce, e-commerce. <laughs> e-commerce. Yeah. That is why the Italians came over here. Now, Saturday, August 13th, 1910, we're going back. This is the first murder. August when? August 13th. That's my birthday. Oh, God. If you didn't know that already. I did. You didn't. I didn't. Did you? I'm going to put it in my calendar. I have a planner. Jen was born in 1910. (laughs) Fun fact, Danny. Danny's birthday is the 12th. Shout out, Danny. Yeah. Birthday twins. <gasps> Rebecca's birthday is the 20th, the day before mine. Ah. Mm-hmm. Saturday, August 13th, 1910, 3 a.m., John and Harriet Crute. Harriet woke up. It's 3 a.m. in the morning. She wakes up. She sees a silhouette of a man. Now, this is the first murder. We're going back to the first known murder of the Axeman. Because I want to show you how the M.O. changes. Wait, I thought the first one was the Catalan. No, that's one of the last ones. Oh. I, He's yeah. just giving us a taste. Oh, I was flashback. giving you the taste okay, sorry. of, of guy. what this guy's about. Now, this is how he gets started. She awakes up and she sees a silhouette of a man standing next to her over a bed wielding a meat cleaver. You know what a meat cleaver is, Jen? Yes. Yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. Fucking brutal. <laughs> like a butcher's butcher block. Knife. Yeah, butcher's knife. Give me your money or I'll do what I just did to your husband. And I, she's like, what? My husband? She looks down. <laughs> Could you imagine if he like, said that to me? I'd be like, husband? I had a husband? This is news to me. <laughs> what? You have the wrong house, clearly. All right, here- Wrong, you're drunk. Harriet, I don't even have a gentleman caller, so I don't know where you're coming from. Harriet looks down at the foot of the bed, but it's too dark in the room. But she does see her husband laid over the bed. Mm-hmm. So she doesn't know if he's dead or whatever. She just screams, oh, oh my God, dead. oh my God, you murdered my husband. Actually, she starts screaming. Actually, what happened is he would say, give me your money or I do what you did to your husband. And then I'd be like, I would wake up and I'd look at him and be like, oh, sorry, never mind, wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> she reaches under her pillow and pulls out a box containing eight dollars jen how much That's is eight dollars in today's money like 25 dollars nicole um it's probably like 200 dollars. damn 208 dollars nicole woo! <laughs> what she pulls out a box containing eight dollars which is around 200 dollars today and he she gives it to him is that all you got 
Or he, no, he's more raspy voice. Is that all you got? Well, that sounded fucking that evil. Was, yeah, weird. Is that all you got? I can't. I don't mean to scare you, Jen. That all you got, Jen? He's not some redneck. <laughs> is that all you got in here? Excuse me, ma'am. Is that all you got? Is that? Is that? Is that all you got? Oh, fuck Better. It. Is that all you got? Listeners, what's your favorite voice? <laughs> it wasn't. And in fact, there was a substantial amount of money because they're Italians. Remember, they're frugal. I told you about that. So there they were two the more dollars somewhere? <laughs> two dollars. There were more money well, under the mattress. That's a lot more money. That's like another 50 bucks. But either she was too scared to say it or she didn't want to give up, you know, the whole savings. Now, he turned around and strolled I, out the I, bedroom. Dude, I would do that, too. I'd be like, fuck it. I ain't telling you where all of it is. I'm just gonna tell you where like half of you it is. You would be like you would be like, I ain't gonna tell you where all of it is, but I'll tell you where half of no, it is. I, I would put I would say like all this right, is all I, got. Sorry. He, I was like, that's it, but then I wouldn't say like, all right, the pearls are over there, you know? Agreed. Yeah, I'd be like, There's yeah. there's also some pearls and you have to find them. <laughs> They're up your butt. <laughs> I remember. Butt plug? Yeah, not like the anal plugs. Anal beads? Anal beads, yeah. <laughs> there may be some beads. Hint, hint. The meat cleaver, the cleaver, the turned around. He turned around and he walked out of the bedroom and into the grocery area. Now, the grocery stores were the front where you walk in was the grocery of fruits and veggies and stuff like that. And in the back, there was like one or two bedrooms. Wait, oh, okay. So there were like, people lived yeah, there, there were homes for the and in Italians. almost every yeah. case where he murdered, th- that was the setup. That was the setup. Every case. That. Every case. How many, how many of the there them can there be? A lot. Of groceries? A lot. With there was a lot. The Italian run groceries? I'm going to show you a picture. You'd be like, damn. Oh, okay. Like, All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> it just seems like I don't know. Yeah. You know? Um but you know, kind of like it's the south like Chinese restaurants and Dunkin' Donuts, they're everywhere. Yeah. So it's kind of like this. All right, fair fair analogy. That's the, a good point. Um for listeners that have never been to the south where I, where the parts I grew up at, a lot of our businesses even to this day are run out of people's homes. I don't think that's a northern thing. It's not. Yeah. We have both home and a business. I think it's economically it's it makes a lot of sense. It's sufficient. Yeah, it could, but it can also, like, safety-wise. It kind of depends on the setup of the home. If, like, maybe it'd be more likely to have, like, upstairs be the house yeah. than to be, like, yeah. in the back room. Well, some of these were two stories. He walks, the, the cleaver walks out of the bedroom just strolling casually. He turns to his left. Rolling on the river. And there he sees the pe- the pet mockingbird just sitting there perched in its cage. Atticus? He unhooks the cage. Boo? And takes the bird with him. Pushes it out that little panel. Well, it was probably worth something. Yeah, this is his first or murder. going to out him. He takes the damn bird and he walks casually down the street. Dauphine Street, D A D A U P H I N E. He casually walks down Dauphine Street with the bird in his left hand. He just literally hatcheted this woman's husband. Now he's casually walking. He walks about a block, sits on some steps, rolls a cigarette, likes a cigarette, and then opens the bird cage and lets the bird fly away. And then leaves the Is cage there a witness? and walks off. No, Who but they saw this? the bird cage on the st- on the okay. st- steps, and they saw the cigarette, and they're like, "What the shit?" You know, hmm. that's weird. It's crazy, isn't it? Then, now weird. that was his first. That was his first go around that we know of. That we know of. Hmm. Well, yeah, the police arrived, and they discovered the bloody meat cleaver. They found it. It was actually still clenched with John Crudy's hair Ew. because he had. And the hair got tangled in the blade, and it was just like hair and blood on the meat cleaver. It was gross. Mm -hmm. The cleaver was actually found to have been stolen from a nearby butcher six weeks prior. Now, this is the first murder. Mm -hmm. Now, his M.O., he's still trying to define it. He brought the weapon with him. This is the only time he brought the weapon with him. From here on out, I don't know if he went... I don't know if he went in there. And this kind of proves that he's not... He never hardly went into Italian groceries because it's like he went in there and he's like, oh, they have an axe. 
I'll just use their axe next time. But he actually, for this murder, he brought his own meat cleaver, which was stolen. Do you think that maybe he could have been a member of the community that would case the groceries, like, in what they had available throughout the day? Like, obviously, like, maybe just a regular customer just to make sure that they had a weapon? Or was the weapon so common that he felt like he didn't need to check? As like before... He used a railroad pin. And now let me throw another thing on his MO. He's always shoeless. They always see hmm. his footprints. That's weird. It's weird, but it, it makes sense because all these old wooden shanties, you know, if you, you, you want to be light on your feet. I mean, he's yeah. in the dead of night, you know, so he was shoeless. Now, John Crudy actually survived. Hmm. He survived. And in fact, two days later after he got hatcheted he was smoking a cigarette at the charity hospital it's like the charity for you know it's like the public hospital he had been cut twice once on the head once on the chest neither wound fatal now the mo changes after the first one this is the first one remember Mm -hmm. it's not any chest anymore it's all straight in the face from here on out now his seven and eight year old son was also in the bed with him and they weren't hurt at all Hmm. is this guy just walked in there weird Two times in John Crudy took bird took the bird walked Kinda, out. I feel like he's it. a sloppy killer. Like he's not even trying. And this time he did take the money. And I, I put in a note here. Maybe it's because he thought that's what he's supposed to do. I don't think he needed the uh. money. But I think so. No one has heard of a serial killer besides Jack the Ripper. So if he's like, I got to go, I want to go hatchet this guy. Maybe I should take the money so they'll think, I don't know, maybe I'm supposed to. Does that make sense? You know? Make it look like a robbery. Yeah. But it really wasn't his primary intention. Now, John and Harriet Crudy had opened the grocer about one month prior before this attack. Now, Harriet, this is very important, got a description of the man. Okay. Really? She said he's 36 to 37 years old. Five foot six inches, broad shoulders. Very descriptive. Which means strong. How the shit does he get in that window pane? Yeah. yeah. Clean shaven, which means he probably isn't a pauper, you know, or mm-hmm. bourgeois. Mm-hmm. Or is it wait? Bourgeoisie. 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 Bougie. Uh, dark hair, thick nose and lips, rough husky voice. Which means he's not Italian, which will come into play. Dark trousers, loose blue workman's shirt, huh? Blue collar, worker. and a black derby hat. Think of H. H. Holmes mm. and what he wears. Mm-hmm. That's a derby hat. That's the description. Now, Chief of Detectives James Reynolds, once he got there and cased the house, he said, "You know what? This guy was just quote drunk or crazy or just plain mad." And in fact. John Crudy, the guy that got hatcheted, agreed with him and said, yeah, he's just some half-witted fella, I reckon. Okay, a known burglar at the time who has spent time in a mental hospital, John Flannery, which was a cocaine and morphine addict, was arrested soon after. Harriet actually identified her, but remember, it was pitch dark. John Flannery was only 25 years old and denied the crime. He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. They put him, they prosecuted him, tried to put him in to go to trial. Doctors stated that his mental state was compromised by drugs and alcohol, and he suffered from a disorganized schizophrenia and was, quote, insane and irresponsible and nothing more than a permanent menace to society. Also, other killings happened during this time. You'll see this a lot. They, the, the cops are like, damn it, the public's getting pissed at us. We got to do something. Hmm. On May 23rd, 1918, Joseph Maggio, I used to have a friend, well, a guy I was in the army with, his name was Maggio. I don't know. Like DiMaggio. Do you know the duh means son of? Oh, you son of a Maggio. The D means son of. And where'd you go, John DiMaggio? Your nation turns its lonely eyes to you. Now, let me... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Woo, woo, woo. Let's talk about the public hysteria. May 23rd, 1918, Joseph Maggio and his wife were butchered. Okay, read... Nicole, will you please read this? 
On the morning of May 24, 1918, Joseph and Catherine Maggio, Italian immigrants who ran a small grocery, were discovered dead and bloody in their bedroom. They'd been assaulted with their own axe and had their throats cut. Nothing appeared to have been stolen. The assailant had gotten by in cutting out a panel in the back door. In the course of their investigation, police found a peculiar message written on the banquet, an old New Orleans term for sidewalk, near the Maggio's home and grocery. Mrs. Maggio is going to sit up tonight just like Mrs. Tony. No one, none of the public thought to tell Miss Maggio, and she had no idea that that message was even written on the sidewalk a block away from her home. And plus, who is Miss Tony? Miss Tony wasn't even one of the victims at all, which makes it seem like there's a lot more than what the police thought. Mm. Okay? That makes no sense. Miss Maggio is going to sit up tonight just like Miss Tony. That's what the message said. That night, if someone would have told her about the message, they could have prepared themselves. Mm. And this is at the end. This is 1918. He's wrapping up his killings. They were butchered. Both of them dead. Now he he's using the axe. He's cutting their throats. I mean, whew, wait, anyway. But Mrs. Tony, nothing ever happened to her? Yeah, who's there, there, Tony? no one knows who Miss Tony is. Hmm. That's the thing. This thing it says Miss Maggio is going to sit up tonight just like Miss Tony, and Tony is spelled T O N E Y. There has not been a victim reported no- named Tony, hmm. which makes it even more weird and eerie that is there's it, probably even more victims. An anagram? We're talking about public mass hysteria right now. A letter. From the axe man himself was sent to the local newspaper, March 13th, 1919. You want to read this letter? You got to do it in like an eerie accent. Oh, yeah. I have an eerie accent. Okay, Jen's going to do it. She has an eerie accent. Hell, March 13th, 1919. Esteemed mortal, they have never caught me and they never will. They have never seen me, for I am invisible, even as the ether and surrounds your earth. I am not a human being, but a spirit and a demon from the hottest hell. I am what you Orleanians and your foolish police call the Axeman. When I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. Why am I doing a British accent? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask that too. I don't know, man. Uh, it sounds good to me, uh, though. Shit. <laughs> <clears throat> you see, when I see fit, I shall come and claim other victims. I alone know whom they shall be. All right, enough, Sean Connery. <laughs> Do you don't like that one? Do you like the British one better? Just read it. Well, he said I have to be eerie. Just read slower than normal. Okay. I shall leave no clue. Except my bloody axe, besmeared with blood and brains of he whom I have sent below to keep my company, keep me company. If you wish, you may tell the police to be careful not to rile me. Of course, I am a reasonable spirit. I take no offense at the way they have conducted their investigations in the past. In fact, they have been so utterly stupid as not to only assume me, but his satanic majesty, Francis Joseph, etc. But tell them to beware. Let them not try to discover what I am, for it were better that they were never born than to incur the wrath of the axeman. I don't think there is any need for, of such a warning, for I feel sure the police will always dodge me as they have in the past. They are wise and know how to keep away from all harm. Undoubtedly, you are lenient and think of me as the most horrible murderer, which I am, but I could be much worse if I wanted to. If I wished, I could pay a visit to your city every night. At will, I could slay thousands of your best citizens, for I am in close relationship with the angel of death. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted. <laughs> angel of death. <laughs> it is really weird. It is weird. Look at him. It's just a... Oof. Now, to be exact, at 12.15, early time. Earthly time. Earthly time. On 
that's weird. Like, yeah, well, he's from he's, hell. Right. Yeah. He he labeled it as hell, like he's yeah. writing this from hell. Yeah. Well, On next is. Tuesday night, I'm going to pass over New Orleans. In my infinite mercy, the I'm angel. going to the make you, going to make a little proposition to you people. Here it is. I am very fond of jazz music, and I swear by all the devils in nether regions and every person shall be spared in whose home a jazz band is in full swing at the time I have just mentioned. If everyone has a jazz band going, well... Then so much the better for you people. One thing is certain, and that is that some of your people who do not jazz it on Tuesday night, if there be any, will get the axe. Well, as I am cold and crave the warmth of my native Tartus. Tartarus. Tartarus. Are those like the stones in the back of your mouth? No, it's like a, a, it's a creature in mythology. Oh. But you know what I'm talking about? The the, the tartar, like do you, yeah. Do you get? I know it's gross. But like you yeah, ever get that? Gross. Do you no. ever get that? No. You talking about tartar? It? Yeah, tartar. Like tartar. On your teeth? Yeah. Like in the back, like your like tonsil yeah. stones. Yeah. Oh, ta- uh, tonsils. Tonsil stones. Stones. Yeah, like that tartar that builds up in the back of your oh, mouth. No, Jen. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> it happens to everybody. I don't. Yeah. It is about time I leave your <laughs> earthly home. I will cease my discourse, hoping that thou wilt publish this, that it may go well with thee. I have been, am, and will be the worst spirit that ever existed, either in fact or around the fancy. The X Man. So, do you think he's a working class individual with no education? Absolutely not. <laughs> so, we like. The only thing that is certain that is if some of your people who do not jazz it on Tuesday nights will get the axe. So he's killing people on Taco Tuesdays. Oh, what a dick. Only if they're not playing jazz music. So they have to be playing jazz music in their house every Tuesday night in order to not get killed? No, that upcoming Tuesday. But Tuesdays, they need to be playing jazz music. No, no. On that particular Tuesday. Yeah, on that particular Tuesday. Which was St. Joseph's Day. Oh, that's in February. I March. Believe. That's in March. Yeah. It's right after St. Patrick's Day. Yeah. All right. It's an Italian holiday, actually. St. Joseph. The Feast of St. Joseph is an Italian holiday. Just as St. Patrick's Day is an Irish holiday. Okay, so... Is the Joseph the guy that you bury in your yard if you want to sell your house? Yes. Joseph is also a carpenter and was the stepfather to Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Okay, so... But then there's Joseph of Arimathea, who was also responsible for helping to bury Jesus and put him in the tomb and, like, ba- like clothe him after. Mm-hmm. But St. Joseph is Joseph the carpenter. Joseph, Joseph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That Joseph. This is the public hysteria that the Axeman was causing. The witching hour, 1215. I thought, was, I thought that was 333. You're looking at a picture of the hysteria. You have the male of the house... Dancing around, yelling at the wife, continue playing. Play, play, play the piano. She's banging on the piano. Jazz music, more jazz music. And the The husband has a a bandage around his head as if he was already like... Yeah, the sad son is beating on the drums, playing the jazz music. They're up all night long. People were getting hospitalized for insomnia. There's an old man, the grandpa, playing trombone. And the little... Guy at the very bottom says, oh, gua, I ain't scared. I just what doing this for fun. This? Ain't we, Alma? I don't know what he says. I don't. He's doing it in that. Oh, gua, we ain't scared. Accent. We just this, doing this for fun. Oh, we, mama. This is after the oh, Axeman sent oh. that letter. After that letter was published, Mass Hysteria. And in fact, this is the Axeman's Jazz. One of the great composers of the time living Gershwin? in. No, it wasn't Gershwin. I don't know who it was. Uh, wrote the Axeman's Jazz to kind of mitigate this and appease him almost. Does that make sense? This is what they would play. I'm going to play you the ragtime version, what they played in 1919. And then I'm going to play you the modern day version, which you guys will probably recognize.
Okay, that was the music that was going on that night. Oh, all night long. And he pre- did he include he wrote the music? Did he Wait, include no, the music? A composer made that music kind of like so everyone could play. It was called the Mysterious Axe Man's Jazz. It, okay. it, it came really popular. Now, this is like the modern day version. <laughs> You guys know that song, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, all right. So the ragtime would use something called syncopation. I don't want to go into that. It's like notes in between the bars mm-hmm. of music. Um, that's what ragtime is. I'm not even doing a good job explaining the mass hysteria. And it was between... These Italians would literally stay up all night and in fact there was this one victim that he got the great idea smart of placing empty milk jugs right in front of like the door entrance and right in front of the window right on the windowsill where the axe man would come in Mm. and when the police got there after he was bashed in to death they found those milk jugs quietly and carefully placed off to the side. Oh. You can't fool the axe man. He's a phantom. Hmm. Okay, what's even crazier, people would hire jazz musician piano players. If they had to go outside their home, they would drive up and down the street in like the Model T Fords and horse mm-hmm. carriages with a piano player in the back playing the jazz music so they would be safe. You had pianos driving up and down the streets of New Orleans all night long mm-hmm. playing jazz music. How I, fucking crazy is that? I wonder if that? like this contributed to the jazz, like almost people like were, perpetuated the jazz culture in New people Orleans. People were mm. terrified. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's like it's making it more of a jazz culture this than maybe it was. Makes you not want to go there. Like, what if the Axe Man comes back? The headlines were sensational. <laughs> Sensational headlines. Axeman slays entire family. Axeman strikes again. Butchers Italian couple. It, it, these people were freaked the shit out. None no one could Italian, sleep. Though, right? Nope. Okay, the reports were even saying that, quote, the Axeman wore wings and was really an angel of death because you wouldn't hear him coming into the home. You would never see him until your husband or your wife just got their brains bashed in. And then you'll see the silhouette leaving the home. He was a phantom. He literally wore wings. He would fly in. Literally. They thought this. And the police were chasing out all the wrong leads. You're an Italian couple and you just got butchered. Let's look at the neighbor. Did y'all have an dispute? Did y'all have a dispute? Let's look at the family friend. They were bringing in the wrong people. Because you know why? The word serial killer wasn't a thing. Mm-hmm. If there was a murder, which there were lots of murders back then, it was over something rational, like a dispute. No one would go around killing people for fun. Mm. That is not a thing. You know, it reminds me, the, the word I like to use is it's not in public conscious. And if you look at the school shootings like Columbine, that wasn't in the public conscious, but then Columbine Conscious, happened. Consciousness. Consciousness. That then Columbine happened. Now that's the thing. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Recently in New Zealand, I don't know if you guys saw the Australian guy that went and shot, I think, forty three Muslims in the mosque, and he did it on Facebook Live. Now mass shootings can be a Facebook Live on live video. Now that's the thing. Now that's in public consciousness. I didn't realize that was on Facebook Live. These people at this time were scared shitless and the police were doing all the wrong things because they didn't know what the word serial killer is. Mm-hmm. Now everyone knew who Jack the Ripper was, but still that word, they, they still couldn't understand. What? Why would Jack the Ripper do that? What? what? He must have been crazy. And, and That's how why, many people are we like talking about right now? About twenty. Roughly. I'll show you a picture. And wasn't sure. Jack the Ripper like n- not not that he wasn't that many? Like wasn't he like twelve? Jack the Ripper killed five. 
And, so and the last, a, the last yeah. victim, he displayed the organs out on the windowsill for everyone to see. So not that I'm saying that it wasn't tragic that he killed Jack the Ripper, killed five people. But in, in like when you think about the scale of things, like they can't even fathom someone killing twenty people. Mm. That's you know? why, yeah. You can't even fathom someone killing someone not because of dispu- a dispute. Just be, just because. You know? Just because they're not playing jazz music on Tuesday nights. Yeah. So on people, Taco Tuesdays. People mm. were literally freaked the shit out. Mm. You know? Because no one goes and kills people just for fun. Right. That, that, is, that doesn't happen. So these are all the known victims just in the New Orleans area. Wow. That, so 16 people. Yeah, these are all Italian families. groceries. Families. Gro- yeah, these are all Italian groceries. See the Mississippi Rivers right here? The police would blame family disputes, neighbors, Joseph Flannery, whoever the shit they could find, but not, they would never admit they have a phantom serial killer on the loose. Every murder, basically, they would set up a trial. Oh, the neighbor did it. And but as the trial really was going like- on... More killings. Trying would to happen. sentence them, more killings would happen. But they, ne- they, so they never had someone who was legitimately. No, they a never had someone. The public hysteria How? caused so much pressure on the police. Now, a newsman reached out to a former detective, Joseph Romano, for an expert opinion. This is fifty years before the word profiler was even born. Quote. Hmm. The murderer is likely a Jekyll and Hyde personality, like Jack the Ripper. A criminal of dual personality type may be a respectable, law-abiding citizen when Mm -hmm. his normal self. Then suddenly the impulse to kill comes upon him and he must obey it. End quote. (laughs) Mm -hmm. That's what he said. You know? I bet you it's like a prestigious person in New Orleans at that day. Now... Well, the author doesn't believe... Like, we know his name. The author of this book that we're reading doesn't actually believe the letter came from him. Really? Yeah, but I, I, don't, I don't see her point. I, I do think it came from him. Why but, do they argue that it wouldn't have? Just because, like, it's not his but, style? No, because she was arguing that it was a working man doing it. But I don't think so. I think it was someone of wealth and prominence. Someone that could get away with that, to plan like that. But, you know, I mean, there's there's like 10 different books written and everyone's got a different opinion. I guess if it yeah, so. if it was written by him, it's I a would, really good book, though. I would she agree really that job. it was. Yeah. Like, it's got to be someone who has education yeah. just from the way that it was written. Mm-hmm. But if it wasn't written by him, I could have been a middle class worker, but they still would have had to have had very high intelligence yeah. in order to have that patience to just with the railway yeah. nail, whatever, like that. I mean, takes chisel a lot away. Of, that takes a lot of chisel away. A wood panel would take a very long time. It would. And he, there were cases where the dogs would be barking. I mean, and it was dead. Of You don't have Netflix going on blaring. You ain't, you're not watching Frasier. Oh, my God. That's what I watch at night. Oh, do you really? Yes. <laughs> I just finished it. <laughs> Holy shit. I met um, that guy on a uh, plane. Kelsey Grammer. Kelsey Grammer? Yeah. I, like, accidentally hit him with my backpack. <laughs> what? What is this? Um, it, I was Holy shit. Get, on the plane from... Was he nice from, about it? Yeah, I was on the plane from like Maui to Hawaii or Hawaii to Maui. Um, and I accidentally, I was, I had like this, I was, was in, eighth, I was in eighth grade. Yeah. I, oh. I mean, it was like those little planes, yeah. was, like the island to island planes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he was with his wife. Oh, cool. And I was like, oh, sorry. I don't know. He was like the row behind me or something like that. Yeah. He seems like a cool dude. Yeah. It, Frazier was like, the Seinfeld, but for slightly smarter people. <laughs> I love, I love Frasier. Yeah. like I literally would like laugh out loud yeah, at it. I liked it too. You know what I really liked is everyone loves Raymond. Oh my gosh, I yeah. love that oh, show, yeah. man. I need to watch it again. And I feel like I didn't get it when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, I didn't oh, either. Yeah. Those I, are, I feel the those same are the way. things that will get funnier now. I didn't feel like just I like got a it. lot of Disney yeah. ship movies. Yeah. Like they're funnier now that you get the inside jokes. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I didn't get it either when I was young. Except the episode with the vagina statue. That one I got. Yeah. That one was kind of like That's obvious. a great show. 
Yeah. All right. You what? know what they? You know what I haven't seen in a while? Malcolm in the Middle. Oh, that's the one they just put that on Hulu. That really? Yeah. That, that's got um. Frankie Muniz. No. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Brian Cranston. Yeah. 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 I want to read his biography, Brian man. Cranston. He seems like an interesting character. Yeah. I really like Brian Cranston. Yeah. And he I don't think he's ever been in a shitty fucking movie or, or anything. Or show, yeah, anything. Like Breaking Bad. And Breaking Bad was just phenomenal, man. I didn't see all of it. Oh my god, that is a fantastic is show. A I saw show. some of it. I didn't get to finish it cuz I was doing You know something. what, Jen? One day. I can't watch it again. You, it's the one that shows you can't watch again. You I gotta watch it I once. could, but I w- it would have to like in the it, future. In, in a couple of years, when we're all filthy fucking rich and all we're doing is this podcast, I want to like, watch. Let's watch. Let's rewatch it. I want to watch Mad it. Men. I haven't seen that either. Oh, I love that show. Oh, that was a good one. The police would actually use what they called third degree interrogation, which is definitely not what they do today. Probably not. Third degree interrogation. Yeah, tactics, which they would try to force a confession. They knew the fe- confessions were fake. But they, as long as they got one, that's the end goal. Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> free Brendan Dassey. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I was kidding. Yeah. All right. Some of the and tactics they would use would be sleep deprivation. Uh, it's not bad. Withholding food. Uh, not that bad. Hanging a suspect out of a third story window. Oh, well, well, that's a little bit extreme. Um, beating and my favorite. Forcing the suspect to sleep in the same room as a dead body. <laughs> oh, no. Fuck that. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah that's I, what I would do. Yeah, I mean, like, honest to God, I probably would confess to something instead of sleeping in the same room as a dead I body. I would, too. <laughs> they would get all kinds of confessions. <laughs> yeah. I feel like whatever it is that I did, I did. I did it. I did. Yeah, it. I'm so sorry. It. Please forgive me. Just tell me what I need to say, and I did it. Okay, so let me talk about, real quick. The Black Hand Mafia, which was one of the first mafias ever to be invented. Hmm. Or invented, that's the word. Oh, see, I said it was a mob story. I'm going to talk before, a little bit before, to give you the backstory on the back, uh, the Black Hand Mafia. This is 1890 in Not New Orleans. Not the Black Hand Mafia? The Black Hand Mafia. <laughs> Bitch, New, please. New Orleans, midnight, October 15th, 1890. This is before... Um, the Axeman was even doing his thing. Uh, New Orleans Police Superintendent David Hennessy. He was walking home late night at work. And his partner, they, they is like midnight. They get to the intersection where he goes to his home and his partner goes to the other home and they split off. Next thing he knows, well, his partner hears a shotgun blast. Wow! And he goes running after because he knows that his partner is in some trouble. Someone has targeted him. Okay. He runs over to David Hennessy and just like in the movies, he's you know, he's got blasted with a shotgun. He's dying and it's like, Who did this to you? And the one thing he says is he opens his eyes a little bit and he says, Dagos and then he he's dead. Dagos. Oh yeah. Yeah. Italians. He called out, this is the superintendent, police chief. He is big news. And he blamed the Dagos. Okay, now, the Black Hand Mafia were Sicilian Italian immigrants. Remember, 80% are Sicilian. Sicily at that time was a very rough place. A lot of gangs, a lot of violence, stuff like that. They came over here started a gang they went by the black hand mafia they used extortion techniques they would go to these little italian grocery shops now these are their own people and they would demand money the black hand mafia they would send letters with an outline of a hand a black hand Hmm. demanding money and then someone else would go in there a week later and collect and if they don't, they would kill. Now, David Hennessy, the one that just got blasted with a shotgun, his mission, and he was doing good at it, was to bring down this mafia. In fact, he arrested a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Now, Huge now of people. Here's, why, here's where I'm going with this. Okay, stay with me. David Hennessy was solely responsible for slowing down the mafia's operation and their extortion tech techniques, making multiple arrests. Mayor Joseph Shakespeare of New Orleans, right after his death, says, quote, 
Scour the whole neighborhood. Arrest every Italian you come across, if necessary, and scour it again tomorrow morning. As soon as there is daylight enough, we must teach these people a lesson that they will not forget for all time. 19 Italians were arrested for the murder of David Hennessy. I'm bridging this together. And in a mid-February trial in 1891, all 19 were found not guilty. Wow. The next morning, 8,000 vigilantes, non-Italians, vigilantes, vigilantes 8, stormed, the, stormed the prison where they were still being kept and with picket signs and all kinds of fire torches and everything else, hang the Dago murderers, hang the Dago murderers over and over and over, 8,000 people. Okay, could the Axemen have been a vigilante in that crowd seeking the vengeance for Hennessy's death by going and killing Italians? Yeah, the Black Hand Mafia was also extorting Italians, but they were Italian themselves. Mm. Is this, could this be Hmm. the reason he was doing that? Because what's the motive? Obviously, it's not money. The motive is bashing in the heads of Italians. They Mm. killed the police superintendent, a very respectable man. Also, from all the descriptions you've heard so far, it was a white man. Mm. The voice, not Italian. What? This is my theory. Maybe it wasn't a white man. Maybe it was a black man. This is my own theory. As reading, doing my research, was it a vigilante seeking vengeance for David Hennessy's murder that happened 10 years prior? Yeah, it could be. Let's talk about the Axeman's final murder, and then we can talk about who you guys think it is. Not that we're going to guess, but... I'm not going to guess, because I don't know. Mike Pepitone, a father of six children. Oh, God. This is him right here, showing you a picture. Once again, creepy. I wish I well, look how they're standing. Mustache. That's not a pencil thin mustache. I know, but it was what came to mind. But I, I do really want to go to the beach and listen to Jimmy Buffett all day with like a beer. It was Mike Pepitone's blood curdling scream that woke his wife Esther. Now, when the police arrived, they noted that the mattress that they were sleeping on was saturated with blood. Mm. And a picture of the Virgin Mary. Kind of like the other one. Yeah. The first one that we talked about. Full the circle. The picture of the Virgin Mary remained hang above the bed. Quote, speckled with crimson dots. Okay. Both the left and right walls were splattered from the floor to the ceiling of blood. This is his last murder. Okay, yeah, and he definitely got murdered. Mike Pepitone was unconscious, but he was very soon pronounced dead. His face was, quote, bashed and battered into an almost unrecognizable mass. This was the last murder, October 27, 1919. Esther, the wife, got the best description so far. That night, she caught a glimpse of the Axemen, and she noted to police, I saw the silhouette of two shadowy figures staring at me from my darkened bedroom before they vanished into the night. They? Yeah. Two silhouettes. Wow. So. Yeah. (laughs) But she she was the only one that saw two. Yeah. Well, that would make sense, though, because if, if it one was per- a vigilante. Well, no, not the vigilante, not necessarily a vigilante, but it would make sense if there were two people because the chiseling of the door, like for one person to do it, like that would take a while. But if you had two people working on it, it would take half the time. True. True. Right. Yeah. Here's some questions. All right. Who was the mysterious Axeman or Axemen? Now, that was the only time that someone had witnessed two mm-hmm. shadowy figures. Hmm. Which is fucking creepy, being his last one. Maybe he, maybe he found someone to do a ride along. Mm-hmm. You know, like that Dane Cook movie where he goes along and kills, or whatever. Okay, right, and oh, yeah, yeah, also my last, my last question: Did he know that Mike Pepitone would be his last kill? Which is why he spent 
an unusually long time with him. I'm talking 18 strikes oh, to the face, straight in the same spot with an axe. But why? His wife is sitting there. But why would saying, that be? What are you doing? What are you doing? He's 18 times and the he, most ever. And he didn't do anything to the wife. Nothing to the wife. And my question is, did he know that that was his last murder and he needed to get it all out? But 18 I mean, times why would in the he, face. Why would he risk that, though? If his, I mean, like, it's kind of amazing that the person hasn't been caught because so many people actually didn't die. He's a phantom. But, I mean, the, the okay. People so believe that. If, if uh, like, it's just kind of crazy to me. If, if someone was had an axe and was like killing you and, and smashing you in the face and I was right next to you. Are you going to defend it? Defend me? Uh, Jump up and kick him in the balls? He's got a freaking axe. Uh, but, uh, but even, Plus you don't know what happens in, in that split second. You're like, fuck, what's going on? You but also, like the fact that I, to, like, I, you know, I wouldn't re- recognize the face. No, a lot of a lot of victims that come in contact with their rapist or whatever don't recognize details. You know that, right? Like they they have trouble. That's why they have to put them under hypnosis and stuff. They don't recognize. They they block them out. Their mm-hmm. brain blocks it out. Kind of like my PTSD. It blocks out stuff. Yeah. They that's why they have to go under. A lot of victims have to go under hypnosis. You know. I mean. I mean, it, it's su- it's such a traumatic. I mean, think about it. You, someone breaks in. It is, and it is you traumatic. wake up to see blood just flying but all over your face I and everything would else. Think with all of the witnesses that there are, and like there's descriptions. Broad shoulders, five foot six, thirty six years old. Sounds like a lot of people. Now they they use what they called the. Uh, I don't. I hope I'm getting this right. The Borelian system, which was basically a bunch of index cards, it was kind of like modern day profiling. But they they would have these guys that were trained in the Borelian, and, and they would basically like write all the description down descriptions down and try to match up people. Kind of like a uh, you like know process of elimination kind of thing. Yeah, and then fingerprints actually. Maybe this is why he stopped, because fingerprints, the first fingerprint case that was used was in 1920. If I get my, if I get my, it was 1919 and 1920, mm-hmm. one of those years. The first fingerprint case was actually used in court. So maybe he stopped because he knows there's more at risk. Evidence was catching up to him. I mean, who knows why he stops? Who knows why he stopped? I mean, who knows? Hmm. Um, I don't know. No one knows. That's what that's what makes it so compelling, because he's a phantom. But he so the total number of kills was how many? Uh, sixteen to twenty, probably more. There's actually a whole history of axe men murders from different states. I don't know if they're connected. I focused on the Louis- mm. Louisiana, but there's some from Texas to Florida. Now mm. I don't know if it's the same guy, but it may be. Are they all within the same time period? Like, say, like close. They're, they're all in years? the nineteen early nineteen hundreds. Hmm. I mean, it could have been a copycat of Jack the Ripper. I mean, but Texas and Florida are both. They're very close in proximity. I mean, Jack Jack I mean, the Ripper. Texas is fucking huge, but other than that, Jack the Ripper, like his story, you know, filled the public with new thoughts and imaginations, and some of the more demented public with thoughts of holy shit i could do that kind of thing yeah. you know what i'm saying like so i don't know man i don't know who i mean no no one will ever know who this guy is ever or guys mm-hmm. i mean the author of this book um believes it was this guy named joseph mumphrey i no i didn't i didn't even put him in there because i really i i don't see it i i can't see it you know a common thug i think this guy was more calculated Mm-hmm. To to murder that many people and get I the reason that he had so many victims that didn't die it baffles me too. Maybe I mean then again it's yeah. is they're, they're not like a sharp knife. Right, it's, an axe is usually blunt. You know, I mean, you, there's only so many times you can swing without getting tired. I mean, mm-hmm. have you ever chopped wood before? It's yeah. hard. Think about chopping someone's face. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm sure he wanted to kill everyone he tried. And I'm sure he saw in the paper that he didn't, and he was pissed. 
which is why this last but murder. You would almost think, though, that if you knew that you didn't kill somebody the next time, you would make sure that they were dead. Yeah, which the, which he had. But he didn't kill the witnesses, too. Mm. Like, I feel like it's almost like to me, it almost but seems it's, like it, he wants to It's not to get like, caught. oh, I got turned the light on. There was like nothing. It's pitch dark. All they could see is a silhouette. They can't. I know, but if I'm right next to you. Sleeping in the same bed, and he only kills you, but not me. Why? Why not? Why not what? Killing why not you? kill me too? Because I, I get the technology is not where it is today. Maybe at that it's time. even more fucked up not to kill you because now you got you're a widow and you have to raise six kids by yourself. Maybe that's the maybe. ultimate fuck you kind of thing. Yeah, or you know, you know that this guy's out. Like if you're a survivor. Like, you know, this guy's out there and he could come back again and, like, you just live in fear. Maybe. Yeah. The the jazz music is what gets me. The fact that people were so hysterical that they would hire piano jazz players to ride around. I mean, think about a big-ass piano. Mm. They're dragging the big-ass piano because they were so scared to even go downtown to the market or anything. But did that even really help? Like, for the people that... That, like people who didn't yeah, do that. Yeah, everyone was playing jazz at night. They, now, they had it on loudspeakers. But for the people it who was were terror. murdered, those 16 to 20 people, Be, yeah, were those people who didn't hire jazz musicians? I mean, no, you know what I mean? Like, did that actually deter the killer? That, there was, that, I talked about a killing that was that night, but I mean, who knows? Hmm. I was gonna say, like, what was did that actually? Deter, if they followed that rule, did that save them? I don't know, but that that letter is freaking ridiculously crazy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. I mean, he signs it is, or he labels it esteemed mortal from hell. I, I wonder if he actually wrote it. I mean, it's interesting that somebody would suggest that yeah. he wouldn't be the writer. Mm-hmm. I mean, who knows? Um, because why at the, especially like at that time, why, I, but I mean, why, I guess who, for just why the, was this guy going around not robbing people and butchering them with axes for no reason, you know? And why did he just all of a sudden stop? Exactly. And I'm thinking it may have been cause the finger, I don't, who knows, man? Like who knows? Maybe he died. Or maybe he was sick. Yeah. And he, I don't know. Maybe he was an old man. I mean, who knows? Shit. Hmm. Never. Know. But I, I think but there, he knew. There are, there are literally no leads. I think like, no, no, no true leads. leads. I think he knew that he was going to stop because this last murder, he hit Mike Pepitone eighteen times right in the face while his wife is watching him. Yeah, he wants. He was like a mania. It, I, it to me when I was reading it, it seemed like he was trying to get it all out, kind of like uh, Andrew Cunanan. And he's just like, "Got to kill everyone right now." He's so hyped up, mm-hmm. you know. He's like, "Get it all out, make sure he's dead, my last one, and then I'm yeah. done." But the fact that she saw two shadowy figures really fucks with me, you know. Mm-hmm. But could she have been imagining it? Like, could she have been thinking it's but him? But you got to you got to remember, it's completely dark. So, yeah, you hear your husband getting bashed in the face with an axe, but you can't see. It. It's dark. It's 3 a.m. There's no lights. Hmm. I mean, to, they might quickly try to light a candle, but how long does that shit take? A can of oil lamp or something. That's true. It's a good point. I don't know. What do you so think, You can't Jen? just flip the light on. I don't know what to think. That was my uh, um, hometown murder story for Tyler about the axe man in New Orleans. Thank you so much. I had a great time researching it, a great time telling it. And if you're a Taco Supremo, get on the forum, submit some t- uh, some more hometown murders because we're going to be covering one a week for you guys. Thanks, guys, for listening to this episode of Talk Murder to Me. Until next time. <laughs>